All right, we've been studying about uh, the gifts and their, the shift of emphasis from spiritual gifts to edification. And Paul did that uh, soon uh, in the early church, uh, soon after setting down, down well, the, <laughs> the beginning. I mean, traveling uh, all through Asia Minor, I think it's called now, Asia Minor. It was called, no, it's Turkey now. It was Asia back then, but not the continent, the uh, province of Asia. Uh, so we're, we're, <laughs> we're studying mainly tonight the, uh, th- the shift from the initial ev- evangel, not evangelical, uh, evangelism emphasis toward the Jews that did not believe, and that was through tongues. Uh, tongues would, they were for the Jews that needed a sign, and they were uh, for the disbelieving Jews. But he was shifting from that to to servicing, I guess you could say, ministering to the people that were in the the local assembly there. And so let's start off by looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 14.5. 1 Corinthians 14.5. I would that you all spake with tongues. Spake, remember, that's uh, past tense. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. So the goal there, through all that uh, tongues and prophesying, and it's edifying. That's what the goal is. Um, I missed something in there just a second. But rather that ye prophesy... Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. Yeah, you can see there, um, earlier he had given them uh, instructions that there were those that were speaking in tongues. They had to do it in order, and only if there was an interpreter, the inference being somebody else, given the gift of interpretation. But here it's down to one person. If there's somebody with tongues, he'd better interpret. You know, In other words, it's fading out. There was much less genuine tongues at that time. So before we get into comparisons that Paul makes in this verse, uh, verse 5, let's look at some of Paul's other mentions of edification in the scriptures to see the importance of edification. Uh, Paul is starting to show the Corinthians this importance of it. And consider these two verses, which are self-explanatory, about Paul's understanding of the need for edification. Paul emphasized the attitude in which we should receive the knowledge of the truth. Now, uh, oh, okay, well, yeah, let's look at this verse. This verse has what I wanted to say. Um, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And that shows the superiority of edification over knowledge. Remember the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden? Uh, it wasn't to be honored, respected, or, well, uh, they were to stay away from it. Well, not to eat the fruit of it. I don't want to <laughs> stretch the word like Satan did. But uh, let these verses from Paul demonstrate to us the vital need for and, and superiority of edifying the church. Um uh, let's read a little further and then we'll bring it up. Um, 
in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, we need to see several things. I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And we need to see Paul's comparison between the body of Christ tongues and body of Christ prophecy. And also we need to see the change in the tense of the action verbs Paul used. Look at the past tense of the uh, the verbs spake and prophesied in the first half of the verse and look at the present tense of the verbs prophesieth and speaketh in the second half of the verse. So Paul made a comment about the the way things were in the past and then he's he, he's about to give them the the way things are uh, in the time of his writing, they, I should say they were present tense at the time of his writing. And also we need to see Paul's further emphasizing uh, of the importance to switch from tongues to edifying. I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And again, prophesying there didn't stop when, when the scriptures were f filled up, were fulfilled, when the scriptures uh, were completed. Uh, prophesying was uh, professing after that, professing those newly inspired scriptures, making them known uh, to the church and to those outside the church. Um, one thing, that we're getting a little away from it here, I wanted to mention earlier, and, and uh, let me find the verse here. Now I'm losing my place. <laughs> uh, greater than, rather, okay, let me get up here. And we're looking at 8, 1. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. If we could just go back there a minute. Now as touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. And that's, that's the point there. That's the thing. Um, the more we learn, do we learn it? Uh, why do we learn it? it pu it's our, our flesh wants to be puffed up. And, uh, you know, look what I know. Look at all this uh, that I've learned. And uh, here I can explain everything you want to know. Uh, all these kind of things, they puff up and it's not, <laughs> not good. Unless the knowledge is encapsulated in chair. The I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, that gives you the idea. It has to be surrounded by and motivated by charity. And then it results in edification, just like in 14.3, uh, I think it is, that says that prof profess <laughs> pro uh, prophecy yields edification and encouragement. Uh, I was trying to think of one other thing, but the point is, Professing God's word produces edification. Okay, so getting back to where we were. Uh, you can see the comparison there. Rather, the word rather, that you prophesied. And greater, greater is he that prophesieth than he. There's a, a comparison there. Than he that speaketh with tongues. Why? Why is that? Why? Uh, well, the prophesying the church may receive edifying. Uh, the a, a preview, if you want to look at it ahead of time, of First Corinthians fourteen twenty one shows us that the function of the body of Christ's tongues was to translate and transmit 
what God was speaking to this people, these Jews, the the Jews that that needed to hear from God, needed to to know how you know how how to please God. Uh, they needed to know that Jesus was the Christ, for one thing. Fourteen twenty one, and let's read it in the law. It was written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak. God speaking there. He says, I will speak unto this people. And yet for all this, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. The last part of 1 Corinthians 14, 5 shows us that almost routinely those in Corinth were claiming to be speaking with tongues when actually there was no understandability uh, understandability under uh, it was uh, it wasn't being understood what they were saying it was no longer god speaking to the jews there was no understanding going on first corinthians 14:6 now brethren if i come to you speaking with tongues what shall i profit you or what shall i edify you uh Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, and he lists, I think it's four things here. If revelation, that would be something revealed and that becomes understandable. Revelation, or by knowledge, that would be something knowable, understandable, knowledge, or by prophesying, something edifying, exhortive, and comforting. That's, that it would be understandable too. Or by doctrine, something taught for clarity and understandable doctrine. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 14, 7, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, Except they give a distinction uh, in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Verse 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Verse 9, So likewise ye, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. Words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall be speaking into the air. That's like saying your prayers don't get past the ceiling. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. Verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. In other words, the, the voice is supposed to signify something, to mean something, to be understandable. If the voice produces mere peeps and mutters, it is not fulfilling the purpose of the body, uh, its purpose in the body of Christ. Um, we'll go on to verse 14, uh, verse 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. And he's obviously using that term as someone that's barred, someone that's uh, uh, away, someone that's not there. There's a, uh, a wall or something. Uh, at the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the term barbarian had a different meaning than at the time that Paul wrote Colossians. In Colossians, barbarian or not was of no, no um, didn't mean anything. There was no significance to it, whether the person was a barbarian or not. Look at Colossians 3, verse 11 where there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all, Christ is all, and in all. 
Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in Acts 19 in, in that time period, uh, but Paul did not write Colossians until after Christ's all man sending of Paul, identified in Philippians 4.15, and after Israel was blinded and cast away in Acts 28. By the time Paul wrote Colossians, he had been sent to all people, including those barbarians. But back when Paul had written his earlier epistles, Galatians, uh, Thessalonians, and 1 Corinthians, he had not yet, Paul had not yet been sent to bar the barbarians with the gospel of salvation. Now, I chose those words carefully. Paul had not been sent with the gospel of salvation, but uh, if they would have heard the gospel and believed it, they would have been saved just like you and I. Galatians 3.28, there is, this is before, Galatians was written before he was sent to all men, and, it's, and it reads very similar to Colossians 3.11, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one, in Christ Jesus. So when he wrote the epistle to the Corinthians in Acts 19 time period, he was still not yet sent to all people, not yet sent to the barbarians. They were still a separate, distinct, unrelated people at that time. So Paul was saying that it would not be God speaking to them. In 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 14, 11, when Paul said, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. The barbarians were not yet included by God in the target audience for the preaching of the gospel of salvation. Then Paul continued comparing the spiritual gifts with the edifying in, in charity in verse 12, even so you, ye, <laughs> uh, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. There's the goal again, just bear. I mean, there's nothing else. Uh, that's the goal. The other things are to produce edification. Do you see the fourth and fifth words there in, in uh, verse 12? For, uh, let's see, <laughs> count them out here. <laughs> Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, for as much as, uh, how much? Paul was telling the Corinthians that just as much as you are, you're already zealous of spiritual gifts, to that same degree, seek to excel or go beyond in your edifying the church. So, in other words, leave spiritual gifts in the dust. Uh, let's concentrate on edifying one another. And Paul was making a definite switch there from tongues to edifying. Next, Paul started introducing boundaries in the use of tongues. Look at 13 and 14 in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. We already talked about that. Uh, verse 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, well, <laughs> there's a drawback to that. It's an unknown tongue. Uh, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is fruitful. Excuse me, unfruitful. My understanding is unfruitful. Unfruitful understanding is not edifying, is it? First, uh, First Corinthians 14, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Well, that, you know, you can't hardly imagine praying with, you know, without understanding what you're praying for or praying without the spirit, your, your spirit being involved, uh, it would just be vain repetitions. In other words, pray what you believe in and, and what you understand. I will sing with the spirit. 
and I will sing with the understanding also. In other words, sing what you believe in and understand. Um, you know, I've been approached by those that uh, want to support their, their uh, tradition of speaking in tongues. And they, uh, they say, you're not, you're not praying in the spirit. Well, if you're not in the spirit and praying in the spirit, it's not prayer. I mean, you hear somebody praying, that comes from the spirit. Th that doesn't come from, from just from a uh, wagging tongue, you know, or I don't know. Um <coughs> Let's go on to verse 16. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For verily, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Got to keep thinking about edification, edifying. Just like back then when they had a um, believing Jewish element in their meetings, not in the body of Christ, but in the meetings where the body of Christ met, uh, the, the Christians, the, the body of Christ people, were instructed not to be a stumbling block to those Jews who could be destroyed, who could perish still, having, having not yet endured unto the end. Well, that's the problem. The new emphasis on edifying was not yet being practiced. Next, Paul further emphasizes the need to switch from tongues to edifying. In verses 18 and 19 and 20, let's start in 18. I thank my God... I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also uh, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. You know, just thinking about it, it makes sense, but uh, it's scripture now. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit, be uh, in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. You can see how that would involve charity, uh, the love of God within you, because otherwise you're getting a, a lot of knowledge that puffs up. Paul was repeating what he said back in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child... I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul was telling those in the church at Corinth to grow up. This impresses the fact that uh, Paul preached that it was God's will for them to switch from tongues to edifying. Back in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul was showing that continuing with, with tongues had become childish. Paul also, Paul also used the, uh, the past tense in saying, when I became a man, and that showed that he meant it was childish to continue with tongues, but it was adult to grow up and edify one another. And uh, that's, that's all I've got for you tonight. Let's uh, hope for smooth sailing until next Thursday, and we'll finish this with the fifth lesson. Any comments or uh, corrections, questions, bring them up.